on, let's say hello to everybody watching on YouTube. We love you. We invite you to the room. We have a, a saying around um, our church, if you're home, you're here. And we're not always home because we travel with work and we have busy schedules and busy lives. And, and that's just the, the day and age we live in. But I want you to embrace that in this new year. I promise you, your life won't be perfect. But if you make God's house a priority, you will not regret it by the, year, yes. the year's end. I can just tell you that from experience. And again, I honor you for coming today. We've been in this series that we're concluding today. I'm really fired up about it. Uh, the Holy Bible series. And, and we called it Holy Bible because Bible translates as book. It means book. But how many know the Bible is not an ordinary book? The Bible is a supernatural book. The Bible is a special book. The Bible has the power to fulfill itself. No other book can do that. It can give you great ideas, but there's no motivation or no internal transformation or no mind renewal that helps you actually live out what it's suggesting you live out. And I love it. Uh, I wanted to just give us a little illustration today because this is our lives, right? And it's a glass of water and looks pretty clear, but I don't know about you. My life's not always as clear as this glass of water. But for the purpose of this illustration, God's Word is like this tea bag that if we'll just dip it in and keep it in there, over time we'll look less like ourselves and more like what we saturate ourselves in. That when I dip, you dip, we dip, anybody? <laughs> Okay, you got to go back to circa 2003 for that, but look it up if not, but just make sure it's clean. Praise the Lord. And each week and every day now with the one-year Bible, we're just dipping into God's Word. We're, we're, we're not asking it to change to fit our preferences, but we're saying, God, your ultimate authority in my life, your final decision maker and I just I yield to you and I surrender to you and look what begins to happen when we just allow God's word to permeate every part of our life not just the easy parts and over time I'm not going to drink this but um, at the end you may want to it just it just we're able to transform in to the image of God through Christ that's the beauty of God's word that we look less like ourselves I, I want to look less like me the longer I live how about you I would imagine you didn't come to church just to leave with the same list of problems and the same mental challenges and the same circumstances. Though they may not change in this hour together, your perspective can change. God can give you a new outlook. He can download a word of wisdom and let you see a new pathway to navigate it. It's the power of God's word. But we've talked about a lot of things in this series. We've talked about like how to understand the Bible. Like how is it assembled? What does it all mean? What are, What's up with all these books and names I really can't pronounce? We talked about how to apply it to our lives. We uh, even navigated, you know, just the power of the word last week. What does the Bible do? It eradicates guilt and it activates our faith. And today I want to conclude the series with a very, very practical installment. Who likes it just practical? Like, man, don't just inspire me. Sometimes we can have just too much inspiration and not enough. I don't know what to do with it. I'm fired up, but I don't, I don't have handles. And today I have one assignment. And that assignment is to give us some handles on how to apply the Bible to our lives in such a way that we use its power to make good decisions in our life. How I many know we live in a multiple choice culture? <laughs> just go to Cheesecake Factory, bro. You're just like, wow, I'm tired from ordering. We live in that type of environment. And sometimes we can make trivial decisions on things that have a massive impact. We, we, we think they're tiny in essence, but they're like a hinge on the door. They have the ability to open something in your life or they keep it closed. Tiny things matter and they have huge results. And so we have to understand that the Bible is the same way, that it's not just a book we read and then leave right there on our coffee table until the next time we engage it. But it can become a blueprint and a filter at which we make decisions on everything. I remember um, some big decisions in my life. I want you to think about some big decisions in yours. Maybe you're facing one today. I hope the word helps you. But I, I remember when I met Kristen. And now, um, shame on me. Actually, shame off me. But um, I, let's just say I wasn't a pastor at the time. And um, I was actually uh, with another uh, female. And uh, <laughs> praise God for a church where you can just work it out. Let's go, everybody. 
Uh, this is 21 years ago, okay? It's just for, you know, side notes. <laughs> but I remember seeing that beauty and said, oh, my, oh, my, what have you made right here, Lord? I was just giving God praise uh, for his creation. And, uh, <laughs> but let me tell you, that decision has changed my life. Come on, husbands. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and receives favor from the Lord. Come on, man. That was your cue to clap right there. Maybe shout. I don't know. I can remember being nine years into a career and loving what I was able to do and just really feeling like I was able to help a lot of people. And through that season, I, I just had that awakening to where I was like, my life is not where it needs to be with God. And and God in his gentleness just kind of wooed me back to him. And I made a commitment to go all in. I didn't even know what it meant. Some of you may make that decision today. Look, people will help you figure it out. God, God will help you order it. Just decide in advance that you're not going to live a double life. You're going to go all in with Christ. But I remember that moment to me. And I was like, all right, I'm doing it. And then God, like, called me to Bible school. And I was like, oh, what, what's up with that? I, I don't and then just, I thought he was just wanting to grow me because I didn't have the faith at the moment he asked me to do that, to do what he would ask next. And that is leave what you've built for nine years and come and follow me. Kind of like a drop your nets. We're going to fish for some other things. But I can't tell you what a big decision that was and what an amazing decision that has been. Life's not perfect, but decisions have an impact. Decisions have weight to our life. I, have you ever heard of the guy named Sam Phillips? Okay, you need to pray for him. Uh, he's probably in heaven, hopefully. But uh, Sam Phillips had a music company that he sold to RCA Records in 1969 for 35000 For my financial people, you're like, look, with inflation, that was a pretty good deal. Problem was, he had the sole rights to Elvis Presley. Bad decision, Sam. What about the guy... Um, uh, Ronald Wayne, who owned 10% of Apple stock, sold it for $800. That 10% today is worth $95 billion with a B. A bad decision, Ronald, right? What about those who got on the Titanic? Bad decision. <laughs> and Rose, why not make a little bit of room for old boy? Come on, there was room on that raft. Rose is comfy on there. What about when the Portland Trailblazers passed on Michael Jordan? Oh, mm, bad decision when Brad Pitt left Jennifer Aniston for Angelina Jolie. When you bought an Android instead of a... You're messing up the text, man. Life has decisions and they have an impact on our life. Husbands, when your wife says, does this make me look fat? And you pause. Bad decision. No, honey. We're actually doing a marriage uh, message in two weeks. So everybody come back for that. It's going to be amazing. But the point is we need God's help making decisions. We got so many that we face every day alone. We're not going to be able to do them as well as we can with God's power. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 2, if you want better insight and discernment, anybody? Yeah. I do. Learn the importance of reverence for the Lord. That just means Honoring God, putting him first on a Sunday, putting him first in your finances, building your life around him and not yourself. That's what it means. And trusting him, he shows how to distinguish right from wrong, how to find the right decision every time. As I was preparing this message, I read a statistic that said the average American on a daily basis makes 35,000 decisions. I make a lot of decisions, and what I know about decisions is whether we're making a lot below the average, the average, or more, decision fatigue is a real thing. That when you're making a lot of decisions, at some point, if you don't renew that strength with a friend or a sister or a brother in Christ or another married couple, if you don't get around somebody and let iron sharpen iron, if you don't let God's word have the final authority, you'll have the decision fatigue and you'll start losing the quality of the decisions you're making. Right. And I don't want us to do that. And I, I'm preaching to myself. I've been preaching to myself all week. I'm just sharing it with you now. But these are some handles, I believe, that will help us practically in our life, in our business, in our parenting. 
a young person where to go to college, use the Bible, who to marry. It's important to hinge on a big door. You need to find a filter and use God's word. How to raise these kids. It's practical for our everyday life. So I came up with six filters. Now, it's not an exhaustive list. I'm sure there's more. But I'm going to give you six filters that we can use to make better biblical decisions for our lives. Is anybody a candidate? Okay, grab those message notes out of your guide and let's write them down. Number one, I would call it the ideal test. What do I mean about the ideal test? Well, ideally, you would make sure first that the decision you're about to make is in line with God's word. So here's the question, does it align with God's word? Like that should, I mean, it could have been a one point sermon today, everybody. If it doesn't align with God's word, then I'm out. And the the first thing I do and I want to do and I want us to do is what does the Bible say about it? So this house, this area, this job, that job, marry this wife, wife, marry this husband, go to college, raise kids, homeschool or public school. All the decisions we're faced with, has God already spoken something about that? And he probably has because he's good and he didn't leave us hanging. But you have to decide and I have to decide Who's the ultimate authority in our lives? At the end of the day, you're going to have a couple of choices. It's either the word or the world. You're either going to follow God and let him be the ultimate authority in your life, or you're going to follow culture and let it speak to you. The problem with the world is it's shaky ground, and it's always changing. And the greatness of God is it's stable ground, and God never changes. That he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's the beautiful part of truth. That if, if, if something was wrong and God spoke to it, it was wrong 10,000 years ago. It's wrong today and it'll be wrong 1,000 years from now. But the same is true on the other side. If God said something is true and it's right and it's noble and it's good for your life, it was right 10,000 years ago, it's right today. God's not outdated, everybody. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's before all things, through all things, and in all things. He's as relevant as relevant comes. And if we don't let him become the ultimate authority in our lives, then he's not God, we are. And I'm not a real good Lord of my life. I don't know about you. I've had that season. Praise God for the blood of Christ and forgiveness. But God wants to be Lord of your life. Let me show it to you in Scripture. Matthew 7 says, Everyone who hears these words, that's what's happening today. Everyone hears them. But here's the differentiator. And puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew. And beat against the house, yet it did not fall. I'm so thankful that the Bible never promises that we're not going to face turbulence, that we're not going to face hardship, that we're not going to face difficult circumstances. It just promises if you build on the right things, which it's an answer of one, no multiple choice, the Word of God, you're not going to go down. You may be bent a little bit. You may feel the brunt of that. But God will even use that season to make you better and stronger. And he'll use that pain for a later purpose. But the Bible goes on to say, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And when that person faced the same list of circumstances, it fell with a great crash. Now, some of us would go, God's kind of mean. God's not mean. God loves you. And just like we don't question the owner's manual in our car, because we trust the manufacturer who made the car knows how the car's to function. That's why God says, hey, you don't run on fear. You run on faith. It, nobody says, I'm going to put water. I just, I'd rather have water in my car than gas. No, nobody does that. Why? You just obey the owner's manual because you trust the one who designed it can define it. And you live accordingly. But we get into our lives and somehow we question as if God is not there to guide us and help us and build us. And we may even think, I'm going to break God's laws. You, you don't. They break you. If I jump off a building, I'm not breaking the law of gravity, yo. It's going to break me. And God, when he says don't, he's not saying don't to withhold from you. He's saying don't hurt yourself. 
this is not good for you. I saw you in your mother's womb. I had a plan for you and a purpose for you. You can choose it. I gave you free will. But if you do, this is not going to play out like you want. And God's a father and he loves us. And we got to pass the ideal test first. Amen, everybody? Amen. Let me give you another one. The second one is the integrity test. Ooh, integrity. Here's the question for us to grapple with. What I want everyone to know. Ooh, it's quiet in this Methodist church. <laughs> if you're worrying about a decision you're contemplating making, don't. Don't not worry. Don't do what you're thinking about doing. you got to magnify the consequences. See, the enemy will put the magnifying glass on the pleasure the decision will give you. But God says take that magnifying glass off the pleasure and put it on the consequences if you do it. Who is in the pathway of destruction? Who gets crushed and hurt if you make this bad decision? And what I know about bad decisions is there's always a secretive nature to them. Bad decisions lead to secrets, and secrets, ma'am, sir, lead to pain. Not just in your own life, but those that you love most are going to be crushed. And so you've got to get out of your own head and get off of the pleasure of the moment, and you've got to put the magnifying consequences. What happens to my city group? What happens to my mom and dad? What happens to my kids? What happens in my church if I go forward with this decision? It's the integrity test. Proverbs 10 says, the man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes crooked paths will be found out. It may start a secret, but it ain't staying there. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but the Bible says what's done in the dark will come to light. And until it does, you're just going to live in a lot of fear of, is today the day that it's going to come out? And God doesn't want you to have that on your conscience because he loves you. He's not trying to restrict your decisions. He's trying to help you walk securely. But secure walking takes integrity. So the question we have to ask is, is my public life different than my private life? Is Brian different on the stage than Brian is off the stage? And whatever that gap is, I've got to get before God in his presence and let him increase my integrity. Is what I say different than what I do? How many know talk is cheap? There's too much chatter today. You can just throw up an opinion and the world sees it. How many know talk is cheap? We need to decelerate our talk and accelerate our walk. Come on, our walk, our nonverbal communication speaks louder than our verbal words. Not what do I say, but if someone's reading my life, am I communicating gospel? Am I communicating what a husband, a father, a pastor, a Christian should look like and live like? I got a long way to go, but my heart is turned to God. Help me, God. I'm thankful I'm not where I was, but Lord, I got a long way to go. And I can't walk securely unless your presence is with me. But how many know God will help you in ideal circumstances and God will help you in you're walking securely. James 4 says, knowing what is right to do and then not doing it is sin. Ooh. I kind of grew up just thinking the stuff I shouldn't do and end up doing was sin. But the Bible says it's not just sins of commission that I commit, but it's even the things I omit. Romans 15 says, if it's not faith, it's sin. So if you can't do it in faith, don't do it. God wants you to have a clear conscience. And you may fool others for a season, but you can't fool yourself. You'll live with a jaded conscience, and it'll mess you up. But God will forgive me. Of course he will. But I know a lot of forgiven people that live with regrets. I know a lot of forgiven people that have broken relationships. I know a lot of forgiven people that have low self-esteem because they gave themselves to someone who left them. I know a lot of people who have forgiveness, but they lost their reward. I know a lot of people who have forgiveness in Christ, but they're living in lots of pain because our decisions matter. And some of them are black and white. They're easy to read. Some are harder. They're more like a gray area. And in those places, the Bible says in Romans 14, if someone believes it's wrong, then it's wrong for that person. So if you have anything in your spirit, any check 
about a relationship, any check about a place you go or a place you don't go, any check about what you say, what you watch, what you consume, then I'm just telling you as a pastor, a big bro, a friend, a son, if you're older than me, don't do it. Don't do it. We want to pass the integrity test. Number three, the improvement test. Anybody like to get better? I, I, love, I love trying to just get better. We, we say as a team, we don't rest on best. That we're, that we're just, we're trying to have excellent spirits, which isn't perfection, by the way. It's just an effort to do the best with what you have. We all have different amounts of money. We all have different amounts of gifts and talents. We all have different amounts of stuff. And God's not asking you to do something that he has not already equipped you to do. But he is asking you to take that which he's put in you and steward it and use it in the best way. So the question is of the improvement test, is this decision going to make me a better person? Am I going to be a better person if I do this? First Corinthians says, someone may say, I'm allowed to do anything. But not everything is helpful. I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything encourages growth. Now, in Scripture, there's places where the Bible isn't extremely clear, and that's an area where theologians would call it Christian liberty, that you have a free will, and if it doesn't violate your conscience, even though I can't do it, maybe you can. But listen, just because you can doesn't mean you should. It, it may not be necessarily wrong, but that's the wrong question. The question is, is it necessary? Is it essential? The enemy to a great life in Christ is not a bad life in Christ. It's a good life in Christ. And God's not calling us to good. He's calling us to best. And the differentiator is not always, this is good, this is evil. In other words, I don't wake up and go, should I read my Bible or become an international terrorist? I, I may pray today, or I may do drugs. I'm just not. And if that's you, I love that you're in church. Come on, let's talk about it. Let's get, you, let's get you healthy. But usually it's not the discrepancy of things that contradict themselves so bad. It's when you're struggling with comparison, yet you doom scroll all day only seeing what you lack. When your God in heaven says, I lack nothing. I have a good shepherd who's given me everything. So that's something that's not God's best for you. It's when we're more concerned with the characters of celebrity than we are the characters of the Bible. Some of us know more facts about Hollywood than we do God's hood. Wow. Like, what, like, what are we doing? Some of you are like, sick on pastor. <laughs> well, if that's you, you may be a couch potato. Get up off that couch. Get that body moving. What are we arranging our schedule around? Some of us know more about the new release of a Netflix series we're going to binge than church, the one you go to, releasing a new series of messages. It's us coming to this place to where we go, maybe I can. Maybe it's okay before the Lord, but should I? That novel is pretty trashy. That novel I'm considering reading allows me to live in some fantasy land and makes me unhappy about the reality of my real life. It makes me distant and not present from the kids right here in my own home. These are things I'm grappling with. I want us to grapple with because we're trying to improve. It's not necessarily evil. It's just things that consume us, that are a waste of our life and a waste of our time. And they're second class causes and they're taking you nowhere. And so if you feel like you're spinning your proverbial wheels and can't get ahead in your life, then maybe ask the question of a decision the Bible can help you with is, is this making me a better person? A better husband, father, pastor, Christian? Am I growing in Christ? Are you out there, church? Because when I dip, you dip, we dip. And over time, as we just stop making our decisions based on our preferences and opinions, the Word of God will change us and transform us and renew us and empower us to live a life we once thought impossible. But we've got a part to play. We've got a role in the decision. The next one I want to give you is the independence test. 
I'm not saying it's good to live independent in Christ because that's a great mantra for a country. Not so much for the Christian life. We need to be dependent. But what I'm saying is we need to be independent from anything that could be addicting. This is the question. Can this become addicting? Is this going to control me? Is this going to master me? I know they can do it. And they seem to be able to do it without hooks getting in them and bondage being created in their life. But just because they can doesn't mean I'm going to justify why I should. 1 Corinthians says, I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Come on. Your life in God's eyes is singular. He doesn't want you to be controlled or dominated or consumed by anything. The first commandment of the ten is have no other gods besides me and the question is is this dominating me and if something's dominating you that's called idolatry that means you've dethroned God off of his position and you've throned whatever that thing is in your life oh pastor I'm not doing I'm not melting any gold and making any calves and we're, I don't worship idols yeah but we worship car symbols we worship clothing labels. We worship the size of our bank accounts. Anybody? We do. We're still prone to these things of seeking status over service. We're still prone to worshiping our work. Some of us have workaholic tendencies, and we need to put that before the Lord. And it's probably a lack of your trust that He is your source and provider. Maybe you know him as your healer and and your forgiver and your redeemer, but maybe God's wanting to show you that I'm also the source of your provision. Trust me, I'll help you get more with less. But we've got to put it before the Lord and say, is this addicting? Could I become hooked to this thing I'm dabbling in? I read a statistic. There's over 2,000 named addictions. we got a lot of choices out there. I mean, I'm just talking about me, sugar and chocolate all day long. Anybody? Have you ever heard the, uh, the phrase, eat like a king at breakfast, eat like a prince at lunch, and eat like a peasant for dinner? It's pretty good, right? It's kind of like, okay. The problem is when I get them kids in the bed, I hear that pantry saying, long live the king. <laughs> Lost. The Bible doesn't, I can eat a lot of it, but should I? Does it, am I medicating something with that food? Am am I meeting a deep need? Now eat all your sweets, okay? Let's don't get legalistic. But I'm just saying, it's from what you would call big things to just what we would call normal, trivial things. They matter. How do you know if something is addictive in your life? How do you know if you have a little bit of an idle issue going on? Here's some questions like what do you dream about most what do you build your schedule around what do you move heaven and earth to make sure it happens what do you think about most these are questions we have to ask look at the scripture I can do anything I want to if Christ has not said no but some of these things aren't good for me even if I'm allowed to do them I'll refuse to think they get such a grip on me that I can't easily stop when I want to how many, how many sweet people in the room? Come on, be honest, it's church. How many salty people? How many go Pentecostal and say, give me both? Let's just go. <laughs> Let's go, salty, sweet. I love it. Let's just grapple with things. I, I think just instead of going through the motions in our life, that's, that's not the life God has. But it's also not rigid. It's life. His burden is easy. His yoke is light, but he does want you to fulfill an assignment while you're on earth. And we need to filter through God's word when we're making decisions. I'm talking about the ideal test, the integrity test, the improvement test, the independence test. Can I give you two more? Yes. I'm going to anyway. Uh, I just like to ask permission. Number five, the influence test. Oh, this is a good one. Because now there's even a category of people on social media called influencers, Right? And some of our young people are growing up as if that's their greatest aspiration. And although it's a great platform to steward if God has given you some favor in that area, but here's the question with our influence. Will it help or harm other people? 
I may can do it, but, but now that I have a platform, now that God has raised me up, now that God has given me influence in my home, has given me influence at the water cooler, has given me influence with a group of friends and those I lead in a city group, maybe I can, but should I? Our actions affect other people. We need to add another filter to our decisions. It may be okay for me, but that's baseline. I'm not called to live for the convenience of me. What does this do to my Christian witness? What does this do for those who I may be the only Bible they ever read? The Bible says a good reputation is worth more than riches. And that we shouldn't do anything that violates our conscience or would damage the influence that God has given us. Why? Because Romans 14 says each of us will give a personal account to God. That day's coming, and my job is to prepare you for that day. I'm not coming at you. I'm trying to prepare us for the most realest thing we'll ever face. The day where we give a personal account of how we lived our lives, what we did, what we refrained from doing, how we stewarded the influence God gave us, not basing our lives or wishing that we had a gift that God gave somebody else. Because God can't bless who you pretend to be. But being okay with who I am, and being okay with the gift mix that God entrusted me, and knowing no matter if it's public or private, I'm still a part of the family. I'm still a part of the body of Christ. My life matters. Without me, it doesn't go as well. And being confident of that in ourselves. We need to decide as the scripture finishes to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. Listen, we're in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. Red, yellow, black, and white. We are precious in his sight. And it's the boat of humanity. And if I decide I would like to drill a hole because I like holes and I have a drill. But drilling that hole causes water to come into that boat and it sinks you or I or both. I need to make the decision based on that, not what I like to do. I I need parents. They're not going to do what you say. They're going to do what we do. When I'm driving, I need to be reminded to speak encouragingly with integrity of the police men and women who protect us. I, I, I need to be more gracious. I need to know that office supplies is not mine. I may can take it and bring it home and use it. That's the Lord's. That TV show, maybe it's okay for me to watch, but if my kids are there, I gotta be mindful of them. I'm responsible, I'm gonna give account, and you are too. We need to be honest in our taxes. Mindful of our neighbors. Well, you don't know my neighbors. I probably have one like it. And I may be the neighbor. Think about that. If you don't have any neighbors that you have problems with, you the neighbor. Simple things. Roll my trash can up in a... Keep my yard in a way that just is a witness to a great God. Customer service. I want to share something. Several years ago, I was, uh, I wish it was more years ago, but let's just say several. Uh, I was uh, at Walmart and paid for my stuff. And I kind of live in a, um, in a go mentality. <laughs> my team will laugh right there. But I remember walking out of Walmart and it's where they have the men or women who are just checking your receipt and as I'm walking out I was nice I think and um, I just got my receipt and I was like hey man there's a guy that time and I said hey man quickly I just gave him a little, little light of fire right there just a little and um, he didn't say anything He does the, I don't know what he does, the stripe with a pen. And I'm I'm walking out, you know, probably like, 
I know you don't do that, but this was me. This is, this is my story. I've got the microphone. And I'm walking out, and a, a, another guy, um, big dude too, <laughs> I was a little scared, and, uh, but, but he's walking out behind me, and he says, unbelievable. And I, I thought it was a bro moment. Yeah, man, you know, they, you know we're trying to, they're slowing us. He said, no, you are. It was embarrassing. And I got to the car and just repented to the Lord, just like something so trivial. I didn't mean anything by it, but perception's reality. Was I representing a, a God who loves that guy? What if that guy came to a place where I was? What if you were acting like that and then somebody you were mean to today at the waiter table, at the waitress table, ends up coming to church and you're ushering? We gotta grapple with these things. I got to do better. We, we need to do better. I want people open to God, not open to him until they meet me and go, I knew it. Another hypocrite. Romans 15 says, those of us who are strong or able and able in the faith need to step in and lend a hand to those who falter and not just do what is most convenient for us. I love this line. Strength is for service, not status. Each one of us needs to look after the good of the people around us, asking ourselves, how can I help them? Let me give you one more, the investment test. Here's the question. Is this the best use of my time? It's not YOLO. You actually live twice. And what you do here matters for eternity. We get one lap around the sun. The Bible even says that lap is trivial. It's like a vapor, James says. And God wants you to not use your life. He wants you to invest your life. How are we handling not everything? Because we're not called to everything. But we are called to something, one thing. Paul said, forgetting what is behind, I press on, press and focus on the one thing, the purpose, the mission that only I can feel because God didn't put the purpose and the gifts in them. He put it in me. And they have a purpose in place too. But if they'll do their job, I'll do my job. We stay in our lane. Then we can hear the words of Ephesians that says, be very careful how you live. Do not live as those who are wise but live wisely use every chance you have for doing good because these are evil times say amen so do not be foolish but learn what the Lord wants you to do God has a plan for you and there's 168 hours in every week and the successful people have that amount of time and if you feel like you're not successful you have the same amount of time you have a certain amount of days that the Bible says, teach us, oh God, to number our days. They're already numbered. Why? That we may gain hearts of wisdom and know how to invest our life appropriately. That God's purpose is for you to find a single focus and live 100% committed to it. This light in the room, if it's not focused, it doesn't have power. But if we focus that light, it becomes a laser and it can cut things. A focused life is better than a distracted life. And you can't eliminate everything, but with the filter of God's word, you definitely can reduce the non-essentials. It may sound easy and it's hard to do. And honestly, it's only gonna be for those who said, I'm tired of average. I'm tired of choosing it easy. I'm tired of living with struggles and situations that I know God has the power to break me out of. I'm going to look at his Bible. No longer will I skimp. No longer will I shortcut. I'm not going to receive good and sacrifice best. I'm going to live in the life of the pages of scripture and watch God do a miracle through a church, yes, but through you and your faith activated in the church. Because we're together in it. And so as we conclude this series, I want us to pray a commitment prayer to the Word of God. 
I want us corporately with all of our voices. It doesn't matter if you're perfect. Nobody is. He was. It's why we have a chance. But I want us to reprioritize the Word of God in our lives. This isn't between you and a church, although we're going to do it as a church because we're family. I'm going to put it on the screen. And I want us to read it together. If that's you and you mean it, don't go through the motions. You don't have to do it. Nobody's going to judge you. But if you want the life God has for you, and you want to fulfill the assignment that while you were in your mother's womb, he already had ready for you, pray this prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving me the Holy Bible. Today I accept it as your perfect word, and I am making it the final authority of my life. Even when I do not fully understand it. When it's not popular. Easy. And even when I don't like it. You are God. And I am not. Thank you for loving me. Enough to speak to me through your word. Strengthen me to love your word. Learn your word. And with the help of the Holy Spirit. Live your word. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said amen. amen. Let's give God praise together.